Hello everyone, and welcome to this uh, little uh, scripted, not scripted, but pre-planned <laughs> stream where Akeem and I are going to be sitting down and uh, having a little chat about uh, imperialism is the, um, the, the topic of the day. And I'm uh, going to be going over it, uh, I think, a little bit, um, it's kind of the basics of um, imperialism and what it is and what it means and how it's relevant to us today um, and that kind of thing. But why don't I uh, put you on the spot and ask you to uh, introduce yourself for the people who might not know who you are? Yeah, for sure. Uh, so I'm Hakim. I uh, run a moderately sized uh, YouTube channel to discuss socialism and other topics related and the occasional shitpost. Um, I'm a physician by profession. I enjoy reading. <laughs> I really don't know what more to say about myself. Um, well, you are uh, a Marx Leninist and you make videos yeah. about, um, you know, political topics from uh, a marxist leninist uh, perspective would you say that that's accurate exactly right yeah, yeah. that is exactly right thank you for uh, <laughs> d defining my the bullshit i do better than i can define it <laughs> <laughs> yeah well um you know we haven't uh, interacted kind of officially before on a, uh you know doing a, a video together or anything like that but uh, I've been, you know, I think we, it's like we kind of, we exist in the same circles. Like, I hear a lot yeah. of people talk about you, um, and like, you were familiar with my videos as far as I know. <laughs> um, I really enjoy your videos, as a matter of fact, but yeah, go on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and we just uh, hadn't, you know, sat down and talked to each other one-on-one -on -one, uh, until quite recently when kind of randomly we decided that well, we should do something together since, you know, we have pretty similar channels, I think, in a lot of ways. Yeah, for sure. It's been a long time coming, I think. Yeah, yeah. And um, I'm sure there might be um, a few things here and there that we might not agree on. Um, I, you know, we talked about this a bit off the stream. Um but I myself don't, I don't call myself a, a Marxist Leninist for various reasons. Uh, but I, I think that uh, this topic, imperialism, might be something where we do mostly agree, um, at least from what I felt when we were kind of planning uh, this stream and, and what topics we were going to go over and stuff. It, it did seem like uh, we mostly came from the same perspective on that. Yeah, for sure. Um, I think just generally, uh, and not to put too fine a point on it, but uh, when it comes to differences of opinion amongst, you know, Marxists, there are as many flavors as uh, can be. Um, but uh, what's important is whatever you consider yourself to be, whatever I consider myself to be, at the very end, our political kind of leanings are kind of centered around Marxism as a philosophical outlook and uh, economic analysis and political strategy. So even if we say, oh, this or that, we might disagree on most of the time, I think maybe 90, 95% of the things we probably do highly overlap over. So that's not really a big deal. Yeah. Um, so I suppose we start uh, going into this topic about imperialism, and there are a million things that we can talk about, but why don't we start off defining imperialism uh what a what actually is it that we're talking about um before we start delving into uh you know theory and everything sure thing um if i have the floor <laughs> yes um all right so when we talk about the concept of imperialism generally it's not something distinct from capitalism we don't talk about capitalism and imperialism imperialism is in, is an intrinsic form of uh, capitalism as it has developed. Um, one of the uh, 
greatest additions to Marxist theory by Lenin was the concept of imperialism. Of course, Lenin didn't do it alone. Um, he heavily built on the research of Hobson. Uh, there was a uh, work of the Austrian Marxists at the time uh, that he also mm -hmm. heavily drew upon. Um, so as with most things, it was a collective effort. But Lenin was really the one to finally uh, solidify and firmly uh, define this kind of formally nebulous concept. Um, and uh, it always gets kind of iffy defining imperialism because there's so many ways to do it. Yes. Um, but basically, we, I think we can think about it like this. Um, the way Lenin saw it, capitalism was uh, an evolutionary process and a higher, quote unquote, higher stage of development of capitalism was imperialism. That's why he titled the book Imperialism, the Highest Stage of Capitalism. Mm -hmm. um, in it, basically, he uh, defined five points um, that basically make up imperialism. And this is my favorite way of defining it because it's very concrete. Um, and if you allow me to actually go through them uh, yes. <laughs> very briefly, <laughs> the first one is concentration of production of production and capital being developed on and on to such a point that they start to make monopolies that can then basically control many different facets of economic life. That's the first one. The second one is bank capital and industrial capital being merged into something called finance capital. And after that, basically, this merging of bank capital and industrial capital um, is just re referred to as finance capital. Excuse me, finance capital. That's the second point. The third point is export of capital. Um, but uh, the reason this is interesting is because before that, there used to be export of commodities. And Lenin specifically makes this delineation, this, this difference, is that it's the export of capital um, specifically, even though export of commodities still takes place. Um, and the fourth point, then, it's a monopoly or like associations of monopolies that form together. Um, which basically can be referred to as a point that even Marx drew up upon, which is centralization of capital. Um, that's the four, fourth point. And then finally, the fifth point is territorial division, not in a colonial way, but in Krumah and his very good uh, neocolonialism, the high stage of imperialism, also kind of links, um, but also in a more insidious way, can we say? Uh, where uh, the largest capitalists and monopolies uh, and the powers that they control uh, they uh, divide the word the world amongst basically sex sectors amongst themselves, um, and we saw that this is a major driver for basically everything we see from uh, IMF impositions of you know this nonsense, the free market reform nonsense, all that stuff. Anything from that to um, uh, military uh, uh, aggression and invasion, and whatnot, which is something very typical of the United States of the past. 50 or so years. Mm. Um, that's a very quick and uh, simple um, uh, bullet-pointed definition. Of course, it goes way, way deeper. Um, but uh, uh, what would you say to that? I think it's a very interesting question. And I think that um, in general, at least, I mean, in my experience with, uh, you know, uh, left-wing politics and, and theory, you tend to run into this problem a lot where you have a single word that can have multiple definitions and depending on what you're talking about a word can mean different things uh, like how the word socialism can refer to uh, uh, a historical materialist uh, stage in history or the ideology itself or it, you know it can refer to uh, post-capitalism or, or what you might call communism or late-stage socialism or the dictatorship of the proletariat, all of these things can have the label socialism. And similarly, uh, imperialism can be used in a lot of different ways. And one of them is as a distinct historical stage, which is at the tail end of capitalism. Uh, something that society and civilization evolves into. Um, and then it can also be used as a broad concept of just, uh, you know, imperializing one country through uh, military or economic or a combination of both uh, might and power. Uh, enforces its will on another 
uh, sovereign but lesser uh, state or a client state. And with that kind of broader definition, that more uh, conceptual uh, definition, you can talk about imperialism in stages of history before capitalism. So you can talk about the Roman Empire's imperialism. Um, obviously, empire is where the word imperialism uh, comes from. And generally, uh, when talking about uh, imperialism in a historical context, when you're studying history and you're doing academic his uh, history, uh, that tends to be the definition you're using. But then you kind of run into troubles when you get to the colonial period because, you know, the British Empire, was that imperialism or colonialism or both? Uh, and that kind of muddies the waters a bit. But, uh, and you know, you can also talk about imperialism um, kind of just as, as, as any country um, enforcing its will <clears throat> on another in, in kind of the modern period. Um, there are people who talk about the imperialism of the Soviet Union uh, following World War II and the uh, subjugation of the Eastern European uh, satellite states. Um, and similarly, you had uh, American and, and British and French uh, influence and subjugation of several European states in, in Western Europe as well, uh, like the Netherlands, for instance, which became heavily reliant on the United States and uh, NATO following World War II and West Germany, of course. Um, so it is a, a kind of an annoying problem to, to be dealing with. Um, the um, differing definitions of, of the word imperialism and I, I personally think of it in the way that, sorry to cut you off, but I personally think of it in the way that um, whenever we, when it comes to uh, definitions, especially when we're talking as, as Marxists, uh, I prefer the very specific solid definitions. I hate colloquial uh, definitions, uh, and uh, that's why I never like this. Uh, you know, among some sectors of the left, uh, you have these people who just consider imperialism to be, like you said, a, a vague, quote-unquote, subjugation. Uh, or what have you, but that's not what it is. Uh, you, the, the imperialism, when we discuss it as Marxists, we're referring to a very, very specific thing, uh, which is basically the, Lenin, the, the Leninist definition. Otherwise, then you would need to refer to, you know, because for example, Kautsky had a different definition of imperialism, um, but nobody uses that mm. th that definition anymore when they talk about imperialism. Same with the colloquial term, for example, what the Roman Empire did. Yeah, but that's not what we're talking about in the analysis of capitalism. So that's why uh, I always, I, I find it a bit, um, it muddies the waters and makes the conversation a bit less fruitful. Um, and that's why I, I, re I really like um, specific um, definitions. But sorry, go on. Yeah, I cut you off. No, no, no. That's uh, totally fine. Um, but that is, you know, why we want to preface this discussion with a, a meta discussion about what even is it that we're discussing. Um, you know, getting all of the, the, the definitions and all of that stuff out of the way first, because like you say, it does muddy the waters. Um, it's very hard to have any kind of discussion when you're using different definitions of a word of had yeah, a lot sure. of um, experiences uh, with that. Yeah, um, definitely. Yeah. So, <clears throat> if we talk, if we are talking about imperialism as something that capitalism evolves into, all right, something you might call it, uh, if you want to be specific about it, or, or or to distinguish it, you might call it economic imperialism, capitalistic imperialism, whatever terminology people want to use. Um, how does that work? How does capitalism lead to, to imperialism? How does that develop? And why, you know, can there be capitalism without imperialism, basically? Yeah, this is an interesting question, but it is, again, usually a question of... Um 
sometimes I, I joke, but I have always such a heavy emphasis on people doing the reading because all of these questions are so easily solved um, by just getting to the uh, to the root work uh, and seeing what, for example, Lana said in the book. Um, but uh, just to uh, like you know give a, a short answer, um, the way that capitalism has developed uh, is basically fairly linear. Right. Um, when we talk about capitalism, of course, there are many different forms of capitalism that exist. The capitalism of the U.S. is not like the capitalism of Peru, for example. Um, all of them are different stages of development, etc. But um, when we talk about uh, what led to the development of imperialism, uh, it's in one very short sentence you can say the limitation of the consumer market within individual nations. That's not the entire definition. Um, there's a lot of nuance that is missing from that, but it's the easiest way for people to understand. Um, when you have capitalists, uh, like the, the capitalist class, and uh, with their both bank and industrial capital, which becomes finance capital, um, and they currently, for example, control, the, they, uh, like with every capitalist country, they uh, politically, economically, and otherwise control uh, said nations. What they want to do, of course, as is their nature, it's not even their nature, it's the nature of capitalism, is to expand continuously. It is a system predicated on infinite growth. Um, and this means not only conquering uh, domestic markets, but also uh, foreign, international markets. Not only this, but um, the uh, chains of not only um, chains of dependency, can we call them, uh, that form with commodity exports are not as deep as those that form with um, the export of capital, right? Um, it's one thing to export rice to a country. It's another thing to export agricultural equipment mm -hmm. because then the uh, uh, technical, uh, t technological uh, reliance of the country that is receiving the export is way higher uh, than the inverse. Um, but the basic idea of it is this um, capitalism needs to expand and uh, once it's finished uh, expanding within uh, a single nation within a dem conquering domestic markets um, it needs to go out uh, outside it needs to go elsewhere to continue growth um, and this form takes uh, or like this development takes the form of, of uh, imperialism but the idea of uh, is there for example a capitalism without imperialism no not really um, the way that capitalism has developed, like I mentioned, is fairly linear, um, and uh, the higher and more sophisticated capitalism gets, um, the more tendency it will have towards imperialism. Uh, so if you have a country, like, let's say, hypothetically, oh, in the next 20 years, Canada becomes the... Canada's already an imperialistic country. That's not a good uh, um, example. Let's say, for example, Peru. I'll give that example. Maybe, let's hypothetically say, in the next 30 years, Peru becomes a massive uh, economic power for whatever reason, um, using capitalist means, it would never happen, but just for the hypothetical, um, a natural next stage in their development would also be the export of capitalism, unless it is controlled in some way. Um, the export of capital, excuse me, imperialism. Uh, what all this means in more concrete terms is that, yeah, there isn't a possibility for for capitalism to revert to a point before imperialism, unless there is some form of massive, like, global destruction um, that ruins economies entirely, which then re basically brings us two steps back, where capitalism begins again trying to conquer local markets first, and then can go afterwards. That's why we saw this reinvigoration of capitalism after World War II. Um, the contradictions had piled up, and then afterwards, with the complete destruction of an entire continent uh, and many other places around the world, uh, American capitalism in specific uh, had new life uh, breathed into it, which then kind of funded this current age that we, we, we uh, experience, a modern age of imperialism. Mm. So in TLDR, um, yeah, capitalism leads to imperialism because of expansion of markets at the beginning, and then with continued development, uh, the natural tendency is to go further and further for infinite growth, number one. Number two, uh, it is not really likely that capitalism can revert to a pre-imperialist stage unless there's some massive scale uh, destruction. That's about it. Mm. I think um, uh, you can think, if you think of capitalism as uh, fire, right, and individual <laughs> companies are, you know, these... Uh, different uh different sizes of, of fires you know the smaller companies are sparks and and bigger companies are forest fires right but 
at, it nat at its nature, fire, although it can bring energy and, and heat and things that you might uh, enjoy, right? Fire is, is, is uh, capitalism is something that can generate uh, wealth at a certain stage in history following the collapse of feudalism. Um, but it naturally wants to grow and uses every opportunity it will, can get its hands on to grow. If you add fuel to a fire, the fire will grow. And in that same way, companies, um, when they see opportunities to increase their profits, as they want to do, because uh, especially publicly traded companies, they have shareholders that they are beholden to. And those shareholders, they invest in a company because they see potential in it. And potential is growth. Shareholders invest in a company that they believe is going to grow. So every publicly traded company and every company really has this central core goal of expanding and growing infinitely. Because it's not enough that you expand your business, you increase profits this year. You have to do the same thing next year too. And you have to do the same thing the year after that as well. Because if one year you're not increasing your profits, well, then the shareholders are going to abandon you. And there comes a point where uh, capitalist uh, private companies have expanded as much as they can in the close by domestic markets. And when a company is handed the opportunity to expand overseas or to take advantage of, for example, uh, a low cost of labor or low cost of resources in another country, and there is nothing preventing them from doing that, they're going to take it because there's no moral or ethical or philosophical consideration made here. A company exists to generate profit, and if there's profit to be made, they will try to make it. And with imperialism, uh, we see that certain countries, especially those that historically have been uh, the victims of European colonialism, uh, they have been systematically denied uh, the kind of uh, aid or reparations that would allow them to develop their economies more independently. Uh, rather, they have been made into um, uh, dependent um, on their previous uh, colonial overlords. And the natural resources, especially in countries like Afghanistan, uh, uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo, are uh, kept artificially, uh, the, the prices of, of natural resources that are demanded in uh, the imperial, uh, imperial core uh, are kept artificially low uh, using economic uh, imperialism, uh, cultural imperialism, conditional aid, or uh, military uh, interventions like the United States uh, has been doing for the past 50 years. Um, so, the nature of capitalism is kind of inherently to develop into uh, imperialism because it's just another uh, market to be accessed by uh, those companies that want to to grow. Um, and capitalism as a system depends on perpetual infinite growth year after year and doesn't, uh, isn't controlled um, you know, democratically or, or according to any kind of goals. The, there's no end point or vic, you know, game over screen or, or windscreen for capitalism or capitalists. There is just more generation of capital um, indefinitely. Yeah, for sure. 
And that's why I think, uh, just for anybody listening, um, I never understood the, um, what's it called? You know, sometimes you see people who are new, new, um, uh, I think the term that people like to use is baby leftists, but mm-hmm. uh, they come and they want arguments against, uh, you know, they've, they've read enough about socialism or they've heard at least a bit, uh, and they feel, like, convinced by it, but they don't know how to convey that same level of conviction to other people uh, and to try to, you know, make them see their point of view. At the end of the day, you can have as many, you know, complicated and sophisticated uh, arguments as you want, but the, the core of the matter is that capitalism is a system predicated on infinite growth on a finite planet with finite resources. It's a, to <laughs> use layman's, term, is, layman's terms, it's a bullshit system, right? You, there's no infinite growth on a finite space, no matter how much you wish there could be. Uh, and that's the fundamental failing of capitalism, and that, enough, that alone uh, is enough to show how useless of a system it is. Whether we talk about capitalism or imperialism and how they relate to each other, at the end, that's more details. Um, but i just like to point that out. Yes, and, you know, there is a Darwinian uh, evolutionary uh, process with uh, capitalistic companies where it, it is the um, the strong that survive, not the considerate or law-abiding that survive, but the ones that are willing to push others down to to succeed. And when you have a company that's in a position to, um, you know, increase its profits, but it would be at the expense of innocent people, the company that refrains from doing that is going to go out of business. The company that push it through and does whatever it is that's necessary to increase profits, they're the ones that are going to grow into a monopoly. Um, and the there is... Um, it's flawed to think of capitalism or capitalists as a system that is run by individuals or where, you know, moral or political or ethical considerations play any role in capitalism. Capitalism is a system that more or less runs itself. It doesn't mm-hmm. even really need uh, the yeah. individuals, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so... Uh, the 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 would you know you could convert Elon Musk or whoever try to convince some random capitalist that capitalism is a bad thing, but capitalism as a system continues on as long as it can. There will always be people um, in positions of power who will you know use that power to to increase profits and increase growth because that is what the system demands of them. Uh, it is fundamentally a systemic problem, not a problem of personalities or individuals. And it's never been the case that capitalism or imperialism is something that is caused by flawed individuals. That, you know, wars or, 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 or imperialism or colonialism, that it would be the fault of some you know, individual leaders or, or people or powerful men who just have the wrong idea about something. Um, and that, and, you know, that is kind of a, a mindset that um, I think leftists, especially those who are new to, to leftism, need to get out of. Um, and I, I, I suppose it might be something that is very instilled in, I think, U.S., culture at least i i feel like i've noticed that a lot more with uh leftists and especially new leftists who come from the united states and they tend to have this very micro or or you know hyper individualistic perception of of reality and, and kind of have a hard time looking at uh, systemic or or macro um um, models of uh, systems like capitalism, and you know it, it's um, it, it you know it is just like a, t- a tendency that some people seem to have to think of everything in terms of individual people who are participating in something. Um, you know, even in in politics, of course, it's easy to think about politics as 
something that has to do with individuals, the individual politicians themselves, you know, the, the Donald Trumps and the Nancy Pelosi's and the Joe Bidens, when in reality, of course, um, especially when it comes to the United States and when it comes to imperialism, it's never really mattered who it is that is in the office of the presidency, just as an example. But the the office of the presidency itself and, and the uh, leadership of the United States government in and of itself, separated from the individuals who happen to occupy those positions, has been a force of imperialism and neocolonialism, and I mean neocolonialism even domestically, um, you know, regardless of, of who it is that's been behind that desk in the Oval Office. Um, it's, it's, um, it, it, it's nice to, to kind of imagine that if only we, we elect, you know, a nice person to be president, then there wouldn't be bad things. But that kind of misses this, this point that there is a structural, systemic, uh, push, uh, you know, the, the, the entire um, system of, of capitalism and imperialism is something that, that exists independently of the individuals, that it is something that has, that continues on, it doesn't just stop on its own, it is something that has to be intentionally abolished. For sure, yeah, definitely. Okay. We'll do right there. Um, so, um, next, I thought we could talk a bit about, uh, what exactly does imperialism look like today? How might we recognize <laughs> imperialism when it happens? Um, it is both very blatant and very insidious. Um, to say, by the way, like, oh, how would we recognize imperialism? Whether you recognize it or not, it happens all everywhere. Um, but the more blatant forms are, for example, the Iraq War. The more insidious forms are, for example, the aforementioned IMF loans, right? Uh, negotiated treaties between countries, particularly imperial, core imperial periphery countries. Um, most of the time, it is in the form of either uh, ownership uh, or direct control or at least um, uh, administrative control over uh, natural resources and uh, access to markets and whatnot uh, of usually by imperial core countries uh, of resources or um, markets within imperial periphery countries. It can be from use of currency, for example. Uh, the French case is perfectly uh, is, is a perfect example of that. Um, oh, it's uh, wait, can you still hear me? Yeah, yeah. All right. Yeah, for some reason, it looked like it lagged. Yeah. Um, uh, but yeah, like what, what I was saying, uh, the French example uh, is mm. uh, a good one to use. For example, when we talk about use of currency, particularly West Africa and Central yeah. Africa, for example. Uh, another would be control of markets, and control of markets is the uh, um, kind of American bread and butter, especially uh, with their control uh, in in Central America um, throughout the twentieth century, um, and the Caribbean, of course. Uh, that's another example. Mm -hmm. The third example is very direct, and it's uh, either uh, control of labor or control of um, resources. Uh, control of labor happens, for example, when uh, through, for example, when American companies um, uh, super exploit labor in Mexico um, to for for the, the products that are produced. That's another form of it. Um, and control of resources is, for example, Canadian ownership of uh, mining, um, like having mining rights to uh, different sorts of mines uh, all over Africa and in Latin America and whatnot. That's mm -hmm. another example. And then finally, we have the political forms of imperialism, also fairly insidious, which are, for example, restructuring, forced restructuring of uh, economies at the behest of, for example, the IMF or the World Bank, mm -hmm. um, forcing of austerity measures, which... Uh, have ties to economic control one way or another. For example, a public uh, electricity system, of, for example, would be uh, privatized and the private shares of it uh, are directly bought up by uh, a company that exists within the imperial core 
for example. Uh, that happened in many different countries. Uh, the most recent example I can think of was in Ukraine. Um, hmm. This also happened. Um, all in all, these are very, the, the list goes, is very extensive. Um, but the most important point is, I would say 80, 90, maybe 95% of all imperialism that takes place is of this insidious type, this that you don't find, this stuff that you'd notice only in, you know, when you look into sources and start looking at numbers and uh, tedious multi-hundred page documents that are official and all that kind of nonsense. Um, the minority of imperialism is this very blatant military interventionist type. Yeah, um, no, just my point is that the minority of uh, imperialist intervention is this blatant form like military uh, intervention. And the United States invading Iraq is a perfect case study because uh, Iraq was very resistant to the penetration of uh, American capital and goods and whatnot into, uh, Iraq, into Iraq. Um, and as a result of this, um, amongst other reasons, petrodollar reasons, also um, access to direct access to our uh, natural gas and oil fields, uh, direct access to our mining. Um, uh, it's not called a mining field to our mines. You do you understand what I mean? Uh, yeah, like um, when it comes to kind of insidious imperialism, uh, economic imperialism, uh, you have a lot of examples of it, of American imperialism, especially in uh, Latin America. And, uh, you know, the, the classic examples are the banana republics of Central America, the um, uh, Honduras, Guatemala, Nicaragua, the companies where <coughs> uh, you, had, you had companies um, like Dole, United Fruit, uh, and um, yeah, United Fruit uh, today are, are Chiquita Banana, um, and they you know, bought up uh, a lot of the the land in these countries in, in Central America where especially uh, bananas were grown. Uh, a lot of farms were, you know, uh, merged with each other, you know, kind of a, a collectivization uh, of, of uh, you know, private family farms under... Uh, these big corporations um, and the uh, diversity in crops was changed to mainly just focus on a single export which would usually be bananas and you would have these uh, companies um, more or less buying up the uh, local governments and you know providing um services quote unquote free of charge you know by building out roads and other kinds of infrastructure providing uh people with uh homes and electricity and water in you know company towns essentially um which an impoverished uh government might look at as uh, kind of like a a good thing even if it might be a bit questionable but hey, here you have this, you know, multinational conglomerate that are coming in here and sure they want to, you know, take charge of our banana, you know, production and export, but, you know, they're going to do all these, they're going to build all these things for us. Of course, the companies are building infrastructure that is necessary for their own uh, companies and, uh, you know, profits, right? They want to build roads, uh, not where it helps people, but wherever it helps the transportation and export of bananas and then these companies end up owning the infrastructure that they build not only the land but also people's houses and the water and the electricity and the roads and this tended to lead to a lot of people becoming very upset you might imagine being uh, forced to live in in usually very bad conditions with wages being as low as possible because of course you had uh, monopolies because these uh, fruit companies they would coordinate with each other to give each other more or less different areas of of these countries to say this is yours this is mine we'll keep to ourselves so that we can each have our you know local monopolies we're not going to fight each other um you know we're just going to come to terms and agree to stick to ourselves, and that way we can uh, exploit the uh, labor of these uh, of the uh, plantation uh, workers, 
much more freely when we don't have to compete with each other. For example, one of the companies trying to um, uh, recruit more workers than the other by raising wages. Uh, if you both of them have designated monopolies, then they don't have to do that. You can see the same thing domestically in the United States with internet service providers, for example. They also, although officially they don't, but unofficially it's very clear to see that they have um, more or less come to a, a mutual understanding that certain areas of the country belong to Com Comcast or, or AT&T or um, whatever the, the names of the other ones are, I forget. Uh, uh, so, sorry to derail the conversation, um, but uh, I just got uh, I got a beat. I'm technically on call today, um, so I'm gonna need to go back. I have like thirty ish, yeah, around thirty minutes that I can. I think that we still have. Sorry, this is a. Uh, I didn't expect this. Oh no, but, no, no, that's okay. Uh, you have to go in in thirty minutes. You said. Yeah, roughly. I'm really sorry about this. Uh, I, I wasn't uh, expecting that. No, that, um, that's okay. We can. Uh, we can continue at another time. We'll just uh, finish up the uh, the current point. Right. So you um, the uh, people who were living in these so-called banana republics, um, understandably, decided to uh, take action against these companies that were running their lives, and they elected politicians who, in you know, promised various reforms. Uh, especially uh, land reform, the nationalization of infrastructure and these things that the, these multinational conglomerate companies, fruit companies had built, and the uh, nationalization and redistribution of company land, where they would essentially just declare that all of this land that is owned by Chiquita Banana or Dole Fruit Company now belongs to the state, and then it gets distributed back out to the farmers who originally owned it, the, you know, the, the family farms that were bought up by these uh, giant corporations. And when this happened, uh, when the, the uh, political, um, uh, when, when the politics in these com companies uh, swayed to the left and uh, these, the profits of these companies were threatened, they would, uh, sometimes with the help of the United States and sometimes through hiring uh, mercenary armies, overthrow the governments of these uh, countries, saying that, of course, they were communist-aligned dictators vying for power and they were going to ruin everything. Um, this was during the Cold War, of course. Um, overthrow the governments and install some kind of military dictatorship that would respect the rights of these American companies so that they could keep exploiting the people and, and uh, you know, keep generating this profit from these delicious, delicious bananas. Um, and this is something that we see time and time again when it comes to imperialism, when a country decides that, hey, I don't think we're being paid what's fair. I think we're being exploited uh, for our natural resources or our labor, and they try to take political action to try to stand up for themselves, uh, you know, by limiting exports or increasing prices. There are many cases, many examples, even uh, today, where companies uh, or <laughs> uh, countries have their governments overthrown and new ones are installed that are more business friendly. Uh, the most recent example you might think of would be uh, Bolivia in 2019, um, who, among other things, sell lithium, which is uh, something that's needed in uh, batteries and uh, electric car batteries and that kind of thing. And as electric cars become more common, the world or the, the industrial core needs more lithium. And so... If Bolivia all of a sudden starts saying, hey, we want to charge a bit more for this lithium because it's expensive running these mines and we want to assure that the workers in the mines have, you know, some decent wages and basic, uh, you know, workers' rights, all of a sudden you find that there's been a military coup d'etat and uh, your, uh, your government's changed. Uh, so that is how you might recognize... Um, 
imperialism in the world today when governments are overthrown especially in the uh, global south those countries outside uh, the imperial core um, when they have their governments overthrown and it's um, justified in kind of very vague ways of we're doing this for human rights or we're doing this for democracy or they were turning into dictatorship um, I, I think it's safe to lean on the side of it's probably for economic reasons uh, I would say it's uh, not really uh, human rights and democracy aren't really things that the United States tends to actually care about um, of course the United States' uh, closest allies um, among them are Saudi Arabia and Israel and so when the United States goes around the world and overthrows this country and that country or goes to war against this and that country and they're saying they're doing it for democracy and human rights all the while still exporting weapons to Saudi Arabia um, you might imagine that there are actually some economic uh, justifications underlying that mask of human rights and democracy that's right, yeah. for sure Definitely. also sorry to derail the conversation again but uh, your partner is very lucky to be able to listen to you uh, on the daily you have a very uh, smooth um, I don't even know how to describe it it's a very calming <laughs> voice honestly have you considered a Korean healthcare <laughs> uh, like a therapist <laughs> Yeah, or something, man. It's so, you know, it's very... Yeah, it's so calming. I love it. <laughs> uh, thank you. That was unexpected, but thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> um, it's, it's a brand of mine almost at this point. I don't know why people people always like, Oh, hi, he's flirting. And it's not that. No, man. It's just the form of masculinity and the culture that I come from is very affectionate. And being mm. affectionate with other men or like complimenting them if there is something to that you do I don't admire or find nice about them is completely normal. But then everybody wants to kind of put it, yeah, put a label on. I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, very uh, silly tangent, but I just had to let you know. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. Right. Um, so I guess talking about um, you know lithium and and uh, electric cars and stuff. Um, I think maybe um, we can touch on um, uh, before you, you, you might have to go the relationship between social democracy and kind of progressive politics and imperialism um, and you know with the example of Bolivia you have something like the Green New Deal in the United States which is something a lot of leftists are very much in favor of um, and there are plenty of good things about the Green New Deal, but one of the things that the Green New Deal relies on um, is uh, technology that relies on batteries utilizing lithium or um, other kinds of technologies using rare earth metals like cobalt. Um, and the something that a lot of progressives that support these plans um, might not think about too often is where exactly these rare earth metals are going to be coming from um, and how this increased demand is going to uh, impact these countries that are exporting them and how it's going to impact the people working in those countries because is it right to you know convert every car in America or, or however many cars to, to uh, electric cars if it is at the expense of um, exploiting labor in the third world. You know, if you think of it in terms of, uh, <laughs> you know, more demand for rare earth metals means that the working conditions um, in uh, countries that have and, and exploit these uh, rare earth metals 
the conditions there are going to become worse. Because increased demand um, means that you know there needs to be a, a, an increase in production. Rare earth metals are very destructive to exploit. It's, um, it can be very harmful to the local environment. A lot of countries, especially in the first world, that might have rare earth metals within their borders choose not to mine them, choose not to exploit those resources because it is so unpopular with the local population. Um, but in uh, third world countries that are exploited by imperialism, economic imperialism, and neocolonialism, they're not left with a choice because, you know, the powerful countries of the world are saying, you have this one resource that we want you to uh, export to us. That's what we're going to pay you for. And everything else, we're just, uh, you know, not going to help you with. We're not going to be um, aiding in the development of any other sector of your economy um, when giving you conditional aid and that sort of thing. Yeah, I think um, whenever we talk about social democracy, and I, I really don't like when people say, for example, social democracy um, and uh, Bolivia, and then they'll say, or the Green New Deal. Um, I know you didn't intend it that way, but just the, the threat together, because they're very different forms of social democratic policies. Um, the social democracy of the West uh, European countries and uh, what the North Americans are currently trying to kind of, you know, shove into their... A confused and contradictory system is inherently dependent on uh, imperialism. It is basically uh, rather than uh, the the capitalist class being the ones that completely um, eat up all the surplus of what that of what comes of uh, imperialism, they give a little more, a few more crumbs to the working class as a sort of con concessionary policy. Um, when you compare that with what Venezuela is doing or Bolivia. They are developing their. They are social democratic as well. They're not the socialist, explicitly at least, or not in an economic sense also. Um, but the social democratic policies that they carry out are not dependent on imperialism. It is dependent on increased state spending from their current, uh, basically from current development levels that they have. Um, what this means is, for example, nationalization of oil in Venezuela or nationalization of mining uh, industry within Bolivia and using the profits that derive from that, amongst many other industries as well, um, rather than those profits going directly to uh, a ruling capitalist class, they go into you know the standard form, social democratic form of increased government spending in a sort of almost Keynesian uh, economic setup, semi at least. Um, this is an intrinsic point of difference. Uh, the social democracy of uh, Western Europe and North America is inherently exploitative of the imperial periphery. The social democracy uh, of Venezuela or Bolivia is not, and that is a very important you know, like, uh, point that we, can, uh, we need to highlight. Yeah. That's the only point, I guess, that I would mention. Um, otherwise, the end-all and be-all of every conversation about this is social democracy, like other, every other form of reformism, is uh, more or less a dead end. They can, it can bring temporary uh, concessions to the working class and improve their lot slightly, but at the end of the day, they are concessions, and when the ruling class will see fit to take them away, they will take them away. Uh, if that has to be through um, just, uh, you know, whenever next part the next party comes into power or through direct military means or through overthrow or through basically what have you rigging elections whatever they need to do they're gonna get it done just like what was done or what was tried in bolivia what was tried numerous times in venezuela what is being done all across europe now with austerity policies etc etc yep. that's just a caveat mm. yes the the social democracy of the nordic countries i myself am from uh, sweden and studied swedish history so it's mostly from that uh, reference point I'll be discussing. Um, but the social democratic system, um, it, one of the ways that it manages to increase standards of living is through um, moving industry, heavy industry, out of the domestic markets um, and relying on uh, industry in the third world, especially countries like Bangladesh, for uh, their textile industry, which um, is exploited by 
a lot of um, a lot of countries in the imperial core um, you know cheap clothes that you might find at, at large uh, stores like H&M or, or Walmart and that kind of thing a lot of that comes from Bangladesh where the wages are very low the working conditions are very poor regulations are non-existent and there is plenty of documented child labor um, but by using cheap labor um, the there is a a super profit that can be extracted and that some of that profit goes toward like you said crumbs of concessions toward the people living here in the nordic countries where we enjoy our social democratic policies for now at least they're you know slowly but surely being dismantled to take back those crumbs that we were given but um, it is a way of of keeping people here um, from wanting to change the system too much because most or plenty of people have been made very comfortable and the exploitation of um, uh, labor in the third world is something that's thought of as very unfortunate but never as something that might be our fault uh, something that might be in some way related to our economic system or our politics it's just the way things are isn't it sad how people are poor and exploited in other countries don't you just wish that we could do something alas um, but uh, the um, the export or, or the, the moving of industries and production abroad um, is something that doesn't stop under social democracy. Um, there have been plenty of attempts by social democratic governments to try to limit companies moving abroad, but especially uh, since the 80s and since the neoliberal reforms, um, the main way of trying to keep companies in Sweden has been through reducing taxes which has been a very uh, inefficient way of keeping companies here because there are plenty of countries that don't tax corporations at all. Um, you know, any company that wants to leave Sweden for tax reasons or, or you know, no company is going to choose to stay here uh, over Monaco or the Netherlands just because we lower our corporate tax rate by a few percentages. As long as we still tax them more, they're going to, you know, going to be looking to move. But in the 50s and 60s, there were some, uh, some attempts to try to limit the amount of companies that were going overseas. But uh, it's a, you know, a fruitless effort. It's, um, uh, what's a good um, metaphor? Like um, walking up a, a, an, an escalator that's going down. It's extremely difficult and you're... You know, there is this this never-ending force going in the opposite direction. Much like the, you know, analogy of capitalism being like a fire. It's, you have to, you know, uh, put the fire out. It's uh, simply controlling it through uh, will or regulation. Um, it's not going to stop it from burning. For sure. I completely agree. What do you have to say about the the conflict, um, the, the you know internal conflict that leftists might be having um, mm -hmm. when it comes to uh, progressive policies versus imperialism? Uh, could you um, like clarify what you mean, by prog like between progressive and imperialism? Well, what's the connection? Um, well, like the example of uh, the Green New Deal, right? Something that ah, that's what you mean. Yeah, some so something that might help um, the national proletariat, but that mm. uh, will have you know that that will 
um, increased reliance on economic exploitation yeah. and, and super profits and how should leftists in the imperial core go about um, thinking about and discussing and organizing around issues like these where they might have to be put in the uncomfortable position of going against something that um, is wanted by uh, a lot of people. I understand what you mean, yeah. Um, that is generally an issue of, again, um, the conflicting... Um, what's the, way, the best way to put this? The conflicting interests of a labor aristocracy in an imperial core country versus the uh, interests, material interests of the global proletariat. So that doesn't mean, of course, that the, this makes I don't know, American workers or whatever inherently less revolutionary or not revolutionary. But what it would mean, more concretely, is that at the end of the day, even if there is a new uh, uh, Green New Deal, what this is used for is to further the control of capital at the end of the day. It is not being used to increase the um, uh, political power or economic ba bargaining power of workers. It is not being used to increase uh, the uh, development of socialist forces or organizations around the world or within the United States. This is a pragmatic step ta taken by a... Um, worried capitalist class or ruling class um, that understands at least on some level the uh, at least some section uh, some uh, section of the American ruling class for example that understands that climate change for example is an issue or the infrastructure in the United States is an issue uh, but only insofar as it doesn't interfere with their direct profits um, so at the end of the day whatever happens with for example a quote unquote new green, uh, green new deal um, is uh, yeah, there will be some more jobs for Americans. The uh, climate impact of American industry would slightly be improved, but not by very much. Uh, infrastructure would be improved, which is a very massive plus for American corporations and industry. Um, and it, at the end of the day, it is a local slight improvement that doesn't really get to any core issues that affect the American working class or the issues facing us in the 21st century. Um, globally, first and foremost being climate change. Um, TLDR, I think, just because there are some aggressive policies kind of sprinkled in there doesn't change the fact that it is nonetheless still based on imperialism, nonetheless doesn't really help the global proletariat. That doesn't mean that as American leftists or whatever, you can't be for the Green New Deal as well, um, but it just should be a small part of your direct analysis, and it should be explained as such that this is not a end-all or be-all or even a cure for any of the issues we have. We would need to do way, 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 way more um, to even reach what would be an acceptable minimum uh, to battle climate change and other. Mm. Yeah, well put. Uh, thank you very much, Shreniv. I had a lot of fun today. It's a very deep conversation. There's a lot. This can this conversation could go on for many, many more hours. Yeah. But uh, I think we covered a lot of interesting stuff yeah. today. Yeah. We'll we'll uh, be sure to schedule another stream for uh, the future. For sure. Yeah. Conditions they are bad and some. in luxury working man of will be forevermore as long as you permit the few to guide your destiny shall we still be slaves and work for wages it is outrageous has been forever